hospital porters, pride and dignity, stop the new world order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV and welcome to this, an update on the Pentec UFO. Now, if you, it's something you need to know before you begin watching this. If you have not seen the first Pentec UFO video, please do go and watch it now. There will be a link in the description box, as per Hapanwo TV tradition. It's actually very important, that's essential background, because this really is a kind of continuation of that story with some additional footage and some additional information and also a very very important new story which is connected to the Pentec incident but it's not there it's somewhere else and it's more recent that's very exciting indeed so wait so stand by for that yeah you do need to watch the first film first this is kind of this is kind of a part two now so I've got my I've got my hat from Sophie the Porter's poet on at the moment which is um, as you know, if you've watched previous videos, this shrunk in the wash. Um, it was meant to go right over my head, but it sort of shrunk, so it's kind of, um, it's a bit too tight. But it is still nice and warm, and it uh, keeps my head covered because um, it gets a bit cold. And also, also the lighting will just reflect off my my hairless scalp. Oh, I get a big bright spot. It doesn't look very good. So yeah, so uh, that's that's what this is about really. And we have um, some very very interesting additional footage. And that's where I'm going to start, actually. I'm going to play you um, some footage, which is by Gary, which he took, this, most of this, some of this was taken on the same day, and indeed, uh, your humble servant does make a brief appearance a couple of times. So some of it was taken on the same day we were there, and you just see things through Gary's perspective instead of mine. But some of it was taken another time, um, which was actually before then, which is another expedition that uh, Gary did to Smilog Woods, with Cass and some couple of other people, so uh, do check that out. That's where we're going to start, and then after that, we're going to move on to the still pictures because there are some still images as well. Um, they are also very, very interesting indeed. Um, and then, then we're going to come to the reveal about well, something else has happened. It's not a Pentech; it's somewhere else, but it's something I think might be very similar. So we do really need to look into that and treat the two things together and explore these various connections. All right, so we're heading up now. I oh, say so we're heading up now to the point where we think the impact site. Well, I definitely think because there's no other explanation for it. Now, this is where Kaz and her friends all arrived. Stick to your right there, it's a bit easier. And as you can see already, these areas at the. This is the area here. Right, this is the area. Right, okay, so this is it. This is it. This is the area. Um, since then, of course, some trees have regrown. Yeah. Ferns have regrown. But um, you can see snapped branches, snapped trunks. Yeah. But here, look again. Snapped this. This one, yeah, I think that one may. This bend was already on that tree before that even happened. Right. But what what Kaz and a friend found? Uh, let me see if I can find what we're looking at again. Looks like some of the trees have been taken away. I think that just belongs to one of the bikers. Oh, I'll just leave it there. Anyway, um, so in this area we're looking at, um, some of the trees had white scorch marks on them. Pinkish white scorch mark. Scorch That's marks. what you see in Thieves Wood, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Same thing. The um, scorch mark. This is where the snow was as well. If you were filming here. There's snow all over the grid. There's snow. No all over. Beautiful view from here. See. Oh, yeah, it's a lovely view. Yeah. Okay, no. yeah, so some, uh, yeah, I've got to focus now. So, um, yeah, we came up here. Those two bends there was already there. Um, this one as well. But the other trees, as you can see, it's one, two, three. Snap. Is that one? Six or seven, yeah, about six or seven snap trees, and two of them were laying down where this, this evergreen sort of tree is now. They were laying flat down, and what's happened is, is that it's coming through this direction, um, impacted here, snapped them, and uh, of course, uh, you know, they've come up here on the, on the um, various days, and they've uh, made some very interesting discoveries. I mean, as Kaz would say, one tree is a uh, almost a, a big thing to talk about as you can see look how big there but a snap six or seven of them is just ridiculous you know yeah. something big and heavy came in here 
very strange. Very strange. Yeah. Like, you know some like... It's like phosphorus, isn't it? Powder. That's where it that's... Somebody's burnt that tree up there. I don't know if yeah. we can get up there and get a sample of that. That would be good. See if you can get the length of the tree in as well. Because they don't snap like that. Oh, the tree goes all the way down there. Dug out. See how it's burnt around the tops? There's no, uh, if it'd been dug out, where's the pile of dirt? What if it was a tree? Just throwing questions in. Bird bin, because there's a. It's a bird mark. No, I know. I'm just saying, like. See that was freshly split there, where it's fallen. a knife I get up there and take a, a sample of that whatever that is at the same height as the scuff marks on the trees all the way round it it's snap that one off that's clean that is so it's a snap no, orange. No you can't oh that's a bit bad at least you can see the discolour in there
tree stopped it. Looks like the bird's on the trunk like that. And it ain't a fire burn, it's some kind of chemical burn. Parks in the bark golf. And this one's managed to bend, but that small branch there has come up. You have one, did you? I think you gotta be careful with these things, then you gotta make sure you're not picking up uh anything from the And now a brief clip filmed by Gary, which I think is gonna become very relevant later in this film.
the third time he's been around now. going on? That helicopter and this thing here have been circling around now for about 10 minutes. Was it a plane or an helicopter itself? I don't know. Fucking land that thing, please. Friends still flying around high.
And now we're going to move on to a series of still images which provide important additional information to the additional video you've just seen. Um, and which in turn provides additional information to my first film, Pentech UFO, which you need to go and watch if you haven't seen it already, because it provides all the background you need to this particular video. Uh, these photographs were taken by Gary Jones, and as you can see, these ones were taken while I was filming the first video. And uh, this is me talking to Kaz Clark at the gate, the famous gate, which is where she was standing when she had her experience back in 2016. Um, so this is, uh, you'll recognise this scene if you've watched the first video. And Kaz is very articulate, she's got a good memory, and she's willing to talk to people who are willing to listen to her to get this information out. So, uh, yeah, this is... Um, this is very, very interesting, very important. I think in the uh, annals of ufology, uh, this scene here, I think, will hopefully go down in history. <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. Uh, somebody has decided to put these stickers on the gate. Now, this is really, really great. Now, you saw this in the first movie, I'm sure. Um, this is something the sceptics find very tacky, but I think it's actually very important because it gives... It, 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 again, it helps build that... Um, in feeling of importance and significance to a certain area where something has happened. So anyone who walks past there or comes to visit for any other reason will see that and they'll think, what's all that about? And they'll look into it and hopefully find out some more information. So well done for whoever stepped those things there. Um, now, of course, they, you see this in Roswell and things like places like that. And, and I know that um, there's actually a, a marker somewhere along a road near where I live where apparently an abduction took place. But for the life of me, I've never been able to find it. But uh, if I do, I will let you know, of course. So these people who do this sort of thing are actually doing a great service to the cause. And now here we see the area around the gate, just inside the gate in the field, which is where um, the, the strange barrel-shaped objects appear, the green, the ones that were sort of green and red and sometimes change colour. They flew in this area here, and, and um, as we explained in the first video, it has affected the quality of the uh, growth as you see in this hedge, there's a couple of bushes in this hedge which have actually been killed by this particular event. It's easier to see in summer, as we explained, because um, that's when there's a lot of uh, foliage around. You can't really see it so well the time of year we were shooting. But um, there's definitely the effects that this object had on the ground around it is quite incredible. As you can see here, Gary's, Gary's photos make that very, very obvious. Oh, and there was a plane flying over at the time. I think this was taken at the time. Um, but it's, you can't really see what it is from uh, this distance, but uh, I do wonder, was it keeping an eye on us? And here we have the entrance to the second field. As you remember from the first film, we walked through the first field with the hedge on our left, and we eventually came to this gate where we had to walk through again, and uh, that was where we came to the pathway that leads along to where the old mine was. And it was on the left, in the field to the left of that, another field, that the strange people those strange, supposedly Vodafone engineers, but were all tooled up with rifles and strange equipment, were staying in their tents and their Land Rovers and things like that. And this now is looking to our right from the pathway that leads through the second field. That's good heading away from the first field. And uh, to the right of that is uh, we're heading for the direction of Garth Mountain. And it was there that uh, was the ball patch. Now, the ball patch is um, an area you couldn't visit, as you know, from the first film. But it seems to have had um, an effect, and it's quite clear from this tree, certainly in the second picture. You can see it on this tree in the second picture. It looks dead. And again, this is easier to see in, to see in summer when there's a lot of foliage around. But um, this tree actually died as a result of its contact with the strange object, as, um, as Kaz and Gary have explained. And here are some more images from the pathway leading through the second field towards the end of the path, which is the old mine. And to the right is Garth Mountain. To the left is the field where all the strange people were camping out with their guard dogs and other things. And um, basically just to, to the right of this lane we're on now is more or less where the strange pyramidal or tetrahedral shaped object actually appeared. Um, which Kaz describes. We're sort of in that area now, so that we're sort of just just to the south of that, just uh, away from now where that happened, because of course the, the actual touchdown of this strange tetrahedral py pyramid-shaped object, which is the si size of a tower block, was where the ball patch is. That's where the strange, jagged, lightning-like uh, 
things were coming down the strange phenomena that looked like lightning coming down from the object to the ground and it has had some kind of effect on the vegetation as you see now in several examples and um, whether, whether it was electromagnetic we don't know it may have been something else it may have been all going energy we don't know what exactly that phenomenon was so when it, it looks like lightning but that doesn't mean it actually was an electrical discharge it doesn't seem to have caused any heat damage but it has definitely killed a lot of vegetation stone dead um, and uh, well obviously further study needs to be done there but you see this you saw similar things actually in the Smilog Wood videos where you where had a lot of death and destruction but that was more to do probably with impact an impact of something physical and solid and on the subject of Smilog Woods we're now going to go there with this series of pictures that Gary took and you can see here um, this, this is additional images of the actual strange location where there was trees that have fallen down there was strange damage to the actual soil there was the burn marks you saw in the footage there was uh, broken trees as you, know, you can see here and there was a strange color colorized bark you have the strange color on the bark which could be a result of radiated heat damage which of course you see in um, you see in um, at the Nottinghamshire Roswell as I've explained you have like it's like there's nothing growing there now except these ferns that come through there's no other trees you see trees that are broken at a certain height and trees that were stripped of their foliage some of the some of the um, trunks remained upright but the foliage is gone which you also see at things such as the the Tunguskum explosion yeah, it's, a, it's a real sore a blot on the landscape and you have like the strange arched over branch which looks um, looks rather strange almost like a gateway and there's a tape around the trees and things like that and um, as uh, Gary has explained it's, it's the whole thing about it being just larch disease absolute rubbish that, and we've already explained why you know, we think that's an excuse and they did the same thing with Bedouin Mountains I mean the, well, the Forestry Commission wouldn't speak to Scott Felton when he contacted them it's like a kind of re real culture of silence as you see that you they either go they either stonewall you or they just they just refuse to answer your questions and so it, and you see the same thing of course in Nottingham because um, as I mentioned you know the researchers there Daniel Bostock and, and Nigel Crowley those two guys tried to get information from the the management uh, company that was running the location where the craft came down and you know they wouldn't speak to them they wouldn't speak to them it's it's a recurring theme with these events and there's a lot of ver there's a lot of similarities between Nottingham Nottinghamshire and this and this and um, that's just one of them and uh, just as an aside uh, we picked up a few more images which uh, might make the British Bigfoot people wonder what's going on here because I think you see a fine specimen right in front of you now and now we come to the most important part of this update because it refers to something not directly connected to the Pentoch incident itself but to something that happened more recently <coughs> in another location but has many similarities because it involves aircraft activity now this <coughs> began actually on the 12th of December of this year so it's much more recent and it's just a few days ago at the time that I'm actually filming there was um, a major UFO sighting of the northeast coastal area of Britain uh, a strange object was seen by several people in Hull on Monday and was widely discussed on Facebook uh, this was described as being like an airplane but having a short body with no wings or tail and it's like a rather like a cigar shaped object and in one instance it hovered silently in the air somewhere in the vicinity of Preston Road and then flew away too quickly for the video to for the witness to record it on video now there were two other reports the same day which from that area in Hull now the authorities appear to have taken them very seriously unless it's some massive coincidence because the Royal Air Force scrambled two Typhoon fighter jets from RAF Lossiemouth which is in the northeast of Scotland and these are aircraft that were armed with a new kind of air-to-air -air missile called Meteor so it's kind of experimental or just been introduced so this is how seriously they took this now the Ministry of Defence is not saying anything about what kind of unidentified aircraft this quick reaction re re alert was all about because that's what they described it as a quick reaction alert to deal with unidentified aircraft um, there's been several incidents in the last few months where Russian aircraft have flown close to British airspace this could be another of those however 
in the other cases, the information was released publicly. They were said it was Russians, you know, and they're just quite keen to blame Russia for everything, as I've explained in other videos. Uh, but this time, it has not. It's been very, very quiet, apart from that one just announcement by the Ministry of Defence. So I suspect there may be a connection between the UFOs seen over Hull and this. Um, and again, this is um, this is similar to something that happened previously, a little while ago, where there was a scrambling of jets to deal with something in the same area, actually, um, over the North Sea. Uh, this was two and a half years ago this happened, and, and I discussed it on the... I talked about it on one of my UFO disclosure videos, I remember. can't remember which one, you'll have to find it. But basically what happened was the two, t two RAF jets were scrambled because of um, something strange happening, some sightings and things over the Yorkshire area and over the North Sea, over the uh, Yorkshire coast. And um, they went transonics. There were sonic booms recorded, which they only do when they have to, because those planes go very fast. Um, and the excuse the government made up was, though, an airliner got lost. <laughs> With all the navigation stuff they have, it got lost. Uh, but for reasons I explained in that video, that's a load of nonsense. It's um, That was obviously a cover-up. There was no, there was no sort of details from the airline. There was no, the passengers weren't interviewed. There was no sort of amateur footage from the passengers or anything like that. It was all a big cover-up. Now, aerial interceptions of UFOs are quite a regular occurrence, and a large proportion of government files on UFOs concerns these incidents, and they date back quite a long way. In fact, to 1932 is the first example I can find, where the Swedish Army Air Corps took off to investigate sightings of ghost rockets flying over Scandinavia. A pilot was once killed, actually, when his plane crashed during an interception of a UFO in January of 1948. The official report said that Captain Thomas Mantell had fallen unconscious from altitude sickness while chasing a balloon. And the uh, US, Air US, uh, US Air Force pilot then died when his plane crashed. I mean, the skeptics just love their balloons, don't they? <laughs> it's absolutely a cover-up from start to finish, and, well... This is another example, but it does connect to something that was discovered by Gary, which is very, very strange. And there's a strange connection here to Pentech. I'll explain. Now, well, what Gary's discovered is that there were some strange aircraft manoeuvres that particular day when all, all, all this was going on in Hull. A lot of strange aerial manoeuvres, and indeed the days surrounding that. And you see here the track of a particular aircraft. Um, this is um, an aircraft which not many people know about. There's not many details. ZZ418, it has a call sign, and there's uh, various statistics of its speed, altitude, and course, etc. And as you can see from these particular images, it was basically cruising pretty much right along the east coast of the of uh, England. And you can see there's it uh, actually hangs around over various towns, such as... Uh, York, it's there, you can see it, you can just see it by the Humber Estuary. It spends a lot of time uh, circling around Maplethorpe and Grimsby. And then it flies up and down the Yorkshire coast from sort of the uh, Newcastle, Middlesbrough area, and then south as far as Hull. Now, this is interesting because this is the, Hull is the area where the UFOs were seen and where the Typhoon jets were sent. These are fighter jets. And also, um, this is also the area where... Um, this thing happened two and a half years ago when there was something very similar happened and they had the cover story of the strange airliner which is very very odd indeed now the uh, these two ch typhoon jets as I said came from RAF Lossiemouth and they flew into this area and uh, it's this is the same area this strange aircraft called ZZ418 was flying as well now what's interesting is the aircraft with the registration number ZZ418 was also very active during the Penturk, in in Penturk incident flying around South Wales and also crossing over the uh, Bristol Channel or the Seven Seas we say in Wales to the areas around Somerset and um, Exeter it flew as far as Exeter as if it was looking for something that was about to happen in a certain area I wasn't exactly sure where so that's uh, very interesting um, interesting another interesting piece of information from the plate from a plane spotters website that Gary found and <laughs> God bless these plane spotters. I mean, they really are wonderful, aren't they? God bless their bobble hats and their notepads. <laughs> uh, they've actually found out something very, very interesting indeed, which may be connected. It's just been announced that uh, there are some Typhoon deployments. Now, the Typhoon fighters are the ones which are used for these aerial interceptions. 
and they have been deployed to Coningsby. Coningsby. Apparently four of these aircraft have been sent to RAF Coningsby in Lincolnshire. Now if you find out where RAF Coningsby is on the map, it's interesting actually, uh, it's actually not far from Boston in Lincolnshire, near the Wash. Now um, what's, what's interesting about um, RAF Coningsby, it was also used in 1987 during the uh, Nottinghamshire Roswell incident. Um, the RF Cranmar was the other one which is now um, shut down. So uh, maybe there is some special facility at that particular RAF location for dealing with UFOs. I don't know. Or it may be a ge geographical concern. It may be simply a geographical concern because they maybe want to get more aircraft a bit closer to the area where all this seems to be happening. Because if you look at the map where RAF Lossiemouth is, it's actually in the northeast of Scotland. So even with a fast Typhoon fighter jet, even going transonic, it takes longer to get to your location than it would if you were deploying from RAF Coningsby. So uh, very, very, that's very interesting. It could be a coincidence. It could be something to do with those pesky Russians. But um, I'm not so sure. I think there may be more going on here. And so well done, Gary, for finding that out. And I think it could be significant. I mean, I've t I tend to dismiss coincidences the more and more I get involved in this because they, more and more often, coincid coincidences tend to be proven false. Right then, it's time to take a closer look at this particular aircraft with the registration number ZZ418. There's actually very little uh, information on the uh, Barry's Plane Spotters websites about this. It's uh, a Beach King Air 350, that's its model, which is a standard commercial. Uh, Standard commercial light aircraft, which um, is uh, produced for all kinds of uh, purposes. It's often sold to airlines or private individuals. There's some um, few statistics here. It doesn't say how old it is. Doesn't say when its first flight was, when it was delivered, when it was rolled out, when it was registered. Anything. It just says model 350CR, the model and the registration number. That's all there is on here. There's absolutely nothing much else. Um, it, all it says also is it's owned by the Royal Air Force. So that's all we know. They're not telling us anything on the standard plane spotters websites. Now this actually is the aircraft we're talking about here. This is this particular plane, this mysterious unknown or very very elusive ZZ418 and it's actually called a Shadow R1, that's its model and it is operated from RAF Wallington as part of number 14 squadron um, intelligence surveillance target acquisition and reconnaissance. That's interesting isn't it? So it's basically it's it's a spy aircraft, it's intelligence gathering aircraft used by the Royal Air Force and um, as we see it has been deployed in a certain number of ways which seem to link it to these rather strange appearances of certain strange objects in the sky whether it's the Russians or whether they're from further afield I believe in the cases of Hull and Penturk they're from further afield now the Shadow R1 is simply a military variant of the uh, Beach Air King 350 um, it's as you can see this if you go and look at the standard Beach King Air 350 you see there's not a lot of changes have been made to the outside they haven't attached machine guns or rocket la launchers or anything sort of glamorous and James Bond like so I imagine most of the changes that have been made are inside they probably put in some special equipment probably most of it classified in dealing with uh, detecting uh, electromagnetic or visual or other forms of intelligence gathering there may be a radio scanner um, jamming devices and other things and who knows what else they use because as I said in the first film the government seem to know when and where these things are going to happen at least within a rough area so uh, within a rough location or area so um, and they seem to be prepared so it's possible that this particular Shadow R1 is actually a part of that and RF Waddington is also in that area it's Lincolnshire it's not far from RF Coningsby so it's uh, quite likely it, that's um, that may be one of the reasons that it's been used and it has been taking off flying up and down the eastern side of uh, England and sort of orbiting just circling in the air over certain areas um, basically if you happen to see this little grey painted Shadow R1 above your town you may want to get hold of uh, what, not myself or Gary or one of uh, or someone else involved in ufology because something like something might be about to happen especially if there's more aircraft of the type like Kaz described flying over um, in more greater numbers now um, as Gary described in the first film he actually did make some inquiries about the presence of this particular aircraft over Penturk and the surrounding area 
um, in the uh, referring to this particular event. Now, um, uh, he actually did receive a reply from the Ministry of Defence. It's uh, the Joint Forces Command, Northwood Headquarters, Northwood Middlesex. Yes, indeed. A good British stiff upper lip sort of place. They were very polite and they, were very, uh, they did respond to the request as much as they could or as much as they were told to, but they said this. Dear Mr Jones, thank you for your emails of the 1st of September 2018. And uh, they quote Gary here, where he says he's writing to request information regarding a military exercise, so-called, that took place in the fields of Pentech, adjacent to Tina Coyd Road at the rear of the Sarna State, 1st of February 2016 and 30th April 2016. Local residents were told there was a military exercise. Why were residents not told the military con were conducting an exercise there? Um, why were soldiers carrying automatic weapons that didn't have a yellow cap on the end, implying they were carrying live rounds? Men wearing for forensic white paper suits, again. Um, why was there no risk to local residents? Why were the military f in the fields of Penturk during this time? And he says, talking about this, could you please tell me why your plane... ZZ418 was spotted by witnesses flying in circles in the Pentech South Wales from the 22nd of February to the 26th of February of that year. Um, yeah, and the plane was identified on public internet flight radar website, so it's not, it's not sort of like uh, it's not eliminated from those particular areas. And um, it said um, he's treat and he, the uh, officer at the Joint Forces Command replies, "I'm treating your correspondence." As a request for information under the Freedom of Information Act 2000, a search for the information has now been completed within the Ministry of Defence, and I can confirm that some of the information in the scope of your request is held. Full details can be found in Annex A, which is like the addendum. Um, however, some of the information falls entirely within the scope of the exemptions provided for at Section 26 of the Freedom of Information Act. This exemption is qualified and therefore subject to public interest testing. Oh, right. Public interest testing. That's a very one Orwellian way of saying it, isn't it? Anyway, he goes on to explain, um, he goes on to explain, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of details here. If you're not satisfied with this response or you wish to complain about any aspects of the handling of your request, then you should contact us in the first entrance at our address in above. If the informal resolution is not possible, you're still dissatisfied you may contact the Information Rights Compliance Team, Main Building, Whitehall, Ministry of Defence. Hmm, so that was it, Joint Forces Command, and then it just, you just, that's it, basically. Sorry, we're not going to tell you. Well, um, I think that's not satisfactory. I think uh, if, if there are strange things going on, or witnesses are seeing strange things, remember, it wasn't just Kaz, it was the barmaid in the pub. If you watch the first film, they should, so if that is going on, and there are, there was an actual operation, not an exercise, an actual operation going on. And it wasn't anything to do with the Royal Mint. I know I don't agree with Richard D. Hall, as I explained in the first film. I think there's more going on than that. Then don't the public have a need to know, as what Bryce Zabel said, and uh, as John Podesta said, a right to know? I think so. It's all very strange, isn't it? We live in a world where what is considered outrageous and out of this world and impossible and far out and weird and kooky is actually re is actually real and we haven't been told and despite various things that have happened it's I don't know whether it's going to be told where we, whether we're ever going to be told I mean this is something I'll go into because I've, I've got one more you have 2018 disclosure video to make which I'll talk more about that there but um, obviously, this is this is something that is affecting us all. It's affecting the whole world. It seems to be a regular thing. The appearance of significant UFO activity is not just some weird out there moment that happens now and again. It came that they one came down in Roswell and that was it. One appeared at Rendlesham Forest and that was it. No, this is a regular occurrence. This is something that is happening all the time. I don't know exactly how often because, of course, this information is suppressed. But it is clearly happening quite regularly. It's it's something we've seen within the last three years. I think it's happened twice, as you just heard. The event in the event in Hull might be something very very similar. There's no crash retrieval there, as far as I know. But there is something going on it's in that part of England right now. And of course, if you watch Rich Planet, you'll know that uh, Richard D. Hall talked about the Lincolnshire Triangle, 
which is something that broke out um, kind of a little bit earlier than what I'm talking about now. But it seemed to, it seemed to be about the same time as the first um, aircraft stra scramble incident I talked about. That was when the supposed missing airline, missing airliner took place. So that area of the country seems to be going through a flap of activity at the moment. The area which I would say is this kind of Yorkshire coast, the Humberside, Lincolnshire area, that kind of North Sea and the North Sea which lies off it. That area is going through a flap right now. But it's pretty clear that uh, these, like I said, these are regular things. Also, even though the government are keeping their mouths tightly zipped shut about the whole incident, like a character from the children's TV series Rainbow, there's no doubt that there are certain indications that they give off, certain behaviours of some of their assets and some of their, some of their um, personnel that give us clues and possibly warning of, in advance, I believe, of things that are about to happen. So we, what I mean by that is we might be, if you see certain aircraft activity, as we found here, that could be an indication that something is going to happen. Something out of this world is about to happen, and that could be useful, because if, for example, we see the Shadow R1 circling over a certain area, we could, that could be, it might be an indication that there's going to be a UFO event in that area. And what, what it means, if, if that happens along with other indicator, indications, it could be that people like me, if we're close enough, and if we have the ability to travel at that time, that is, you UFO enthusiasts, as the skeptics call us in their derogatory tones, or people who are researching into UFOs can actually get there. We can actually get to the location and be there when the event happens. And get the evidence. That, I think, is the moral of this whole story. That, I think, is what Gary, Kaz, and, and myself have revealed here. I don't know whether it will happen. I don't have the ability to, to, to know exactly... Well, I know, we, but even if we have these clues, I might not be able to get to certain areas. For example, these things happen all over the world, and I mean, I'd have limited ability to travel, like most people do. But if you were there... I mean, there's, there's, you, there's UFO enthusiasts everywhere. There's UFO researchers everywhere. So if you hear that there's some strange aircraft activity in your area, you know, get on it. Go, go and look into it and do it quickly because you never know when the UFO might appear. It could be anywhere. The next major UFO event, and that is a CE2 crash retrieval or maybe even aliens appearing or some mass abduction or anything like that. These things could be about it could be about to happen again, and they could be about to happen anywhere. They could be about to happen near where you live. Thank you for watching Hapanwo TV, and a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year if uh, you don't happen to tune in before then, because there will be some more videos coming up before Christmas. I've got some plans. So um, thank you for watching. Hospital Port as pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. <laughs>